let's start um, with uh, heading to Ottawa for the negotiations. The Saskatchewan position, what, what were you taking to Ottawa? Uh, what were your expectations? Well, I think the word that I would use is hope. We had the hope, uh, the wish if that's appropriate, that something out of that last week of negotiations would lead to uh, the unification of the country, most importantly the independence, the final formal independence of the country, in other words agreement. We however I think um, had that hope tempered with a lot of fear and trepidation uh, because I had been through, as Premier Blakeney had been through, three years or more of the very hard negotiations which involved a very complicated set of issues and very complex characters from late Premier René Levesque to Premier Lougheed to Alan Blakeney and, and, and the players below. So it was a question of really a, a hope or a, a desire, a goal. The expectation I think was laden with many doubts. Sir, I just have to, uh, you just put it right down here. Obviously. So I did it. I typed it. Okay. I did it over him? No, no, it was good. It was good. I, just I touched myself. That's down good. There. <laughs> <laughs> Better than what I normally touch myself. <laughs> the um, and as the conference started, um, were your hopes tempered rather immediately? I mean, it was was it rough going that first couple of days? It was very rough going, uh, right from the opening conference on Monday where all the First Ministers made their opening statements, uh, you could see nothing had changed very much. At least one could conclude that. Looking back at it, and it may be tempered by the fog of time, my comment, I always had a feeling that when push came to shove, and it was the crunch time to make a decision, a vast number of the pro provinces and the Prime Minister would come to an agreement. Uh, it may have been a wish. It was a personal thought. I was uncertain and increasingly uncertain that we'd ever get Mr. Levesque and the Quebec uh, government to be on side. But I must say, these emotions were up and down almost by the speech or the moment or the second. And at the end of the first day, uh, I'm, th th that the expectation was greatly tempered by what I'd heard, which was very depressing. Very competing visions of the country about the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, about Quebec, Quebec's role, the West's role. It was a uh, it was a worrisome moment. And the, the beginning of the process with yourself and Mr. Chrétien, Mr. McMurtry, mm. did, at, at what point did that kick in? Did, did, did you guys start to talk among yourselves? Well, Chrétien and myself, we had, I had a very good relationship with Chrétien right from the very beginning. He's a very personable and highly intelligent man. Uh, what he saw in a Westerner, Demo New Democrats, another issue, but we struck it off well. And so as co-chairs, it was inevitable that our meetings would take place frequently. Uh, we would have to deal with issues of agenda, um, make sure that the subcommittees were working, deal with the reports from the su subcommittees. We had 14 subcommittees studying the various items which had been assigned to us by the Prime Minister and the Premiers. So there's a lot of uh, day-to-day -day contact, face-to-face -face contact. Uh, we even traveled together when we had, had our conferences outside of Ottawa and the hotels had put us up in the very top suites. I can say that now because nobody has to worry about the expenses uh, too much out of courtesy for Chrétien at one end and me at the other end. And so you can see what I'm leading to is that after a while, in, in the case of Chrétien it was very, very quickly, uh, I had a very strong attachment to his uh, uh, love of Canada, I, a very sharp mind, uh, his sense of humor, which is well known, uh, and uh, we struck it off. Roy McMurtry and I, of course, of course, go back from the days when we were attorney generals together, and we dealt with attorney general's issues, and he's a, a different kind of character, more laid back. Um, Gretchen and I are more intense, but he brought uh, the weight of Ontario to the deliberations, and also some very, very thoughtful uh, comments. So we bonded. Uh, but I think the process is what did it. And may I add very quickly, so it isn't only the three of us, I think so it was with the other ministers as well. We bonded with them, they bonded with us, we had our differences. And more importantly perhaps, so it was with the officials. 
And we had almost a small village of 300 officials traveling with us. And when you're asked to get a, an agreement on the natural resources section, you get frustrated, you get angered, and there's an imperative, and it keeps on moving, sense of urgency, and then you're almost in a Stockholm Syndrome-like situation where you are with your opponents or your adversaries. I think trust was built, and this, I think, was the key. How did that lead to, to the Kitchen Accord? I mean, at what, at what point, what made the three of you get together? Well, as we saw that week progress uh, and things got very serious because we adjourned from the public hearings then into the private hearings, and in those hearings there was just uh, the Prime Minister or the Premier, one minister and one official, so three per delegation. There were, what, 11 of us, 33, 35 people, and they were closed. And the conversation was blunt. It was intellectually sharp, certainly the exchanges between uh, Trudeau and Blakeney, my premier, and Trudeau and Levesque were, with Levesque it was emotional and sharp. Uh, others contributed obviously as well, Davis and Lockheed. It, it was very, very despairing. And what happened was uh, sometime late on Wednesday afternoon, Levesque accepted a challenge by the prime minister that if we couldn't solve it, that he would take the entire issue to a national referendum. And he turned around to Levesque and said, do you accept the challenge or do you agree? And Levesque said, yes. The informal rule of the Gang of Eight, those of us who were in opposition, was that nobody could leave the Gang of Eight unless they forewarned. But then you were free to leave. This caught everybody by surprise in the remainder of the gang. And more than that, nobody wanted to see this, this at least I sensed, to see this eventuality. Uh, and that shattered the alliance of the eight the meeting was adjourned, there was chaos, in effect, maybe that's what we're saying in a bit, but in my memory, there's just a, a range of faces and people and everybody scrambling around. And Kretchen and I had been in conversation three or four times every day during that week, maybe more, over the telephone and face-to-face, -face, reviewing the circumstances. And we got together and he said, uh, this is serious, or words to that effect. I said, obviously very serious, where should we go? And he said, uh, I'll find something, and we just found a little pantry. CBC actually has uh, documented this little room that we met and uh, I always had the habit of carrying around a little notepad and a paper of all the writing on the Kitchen Accord is so called. It really shouldn't be called Kitchen Accord, it should be Kitchen Proposals uh, because the Accord is made ultimately by the First Ministers but all that was in my handwriting is we started right away and because we knew each other and we knew the issues and we trusted each other you could go very quickly to the heart of the matter. And so I remember saying to Christian, well, we agree on patriation, right? So yes, patri no, we agree on the mending formula, which is the Vancouver mending formula without getting the details, right? Yes, we did. And down the line, there were a few, one or two contentious moments. Uh, Roy McMurtry joined us at about that time as well and went through it very quickly. And we were able to do that because we had spent three years knowing the rather intricate, complex legal issues, constitutional issues, and more importantly, we trusted each other and we knew where the potential areas of agreement might, might lie for the acceptance by the First Ministers. We didn't know. It took about five, six, seven minutes, maybe less. And uh, Chrétien said, well, I'm going to take this to Trudeau. Can you take it to Blakeney? And Roy, you take it to Bill Davis. And so happened Al was right outside the door, maybe looking for me or wanting a cup of coffee or something. And I said, Alan, this is what Chrétien thinks is possible, and here's what I think is possible. With, he asked me how this came about. I described it to him. He thought about it, he asked some very penetrating questions, it was blatant, he was really the intellectual equal of, of, of Trudeau's in my judgment at that conference. Some of them I couldn't answer, but he said, all right, I see you've got marked room 481, which was his suite that everybody would meet at 9.30. How'd you do that? I said, I just expected you'd be there by 9.30 and that maybe a meeting could start at that point, and he agreed to do it. And the rest then took place with hard bargaining, hard negotiations. Others came to the table. Premier Peckford came to the table with his proposals. I think they were being floated sometime during the day earlier. A lot of communication back and forth. And uh, by about 3 o'clock in the morning, Thursday morning, maybe later, seemed later, we had a deal. Well, we thought, had, we, thought we had a deal. It wasn't finalized until after the one-hour private meeting and then the public meeting the next day, Thursday. But I have no doubt Chrétien was determined to 
metaphorically speaking, pull the constitutional gun out of the holster and put us through a referendum nationally. And I think that just shook up everybody. If you can imagine debating the language and the issues of the speciality of Quebec and Western interests and the like, I think that's what really forced it. I think he stumbled into it a bit, but nonetheless, there, there, there it was. The, um, that whole atmosphere, uh, I guess, coming out of the referendum in Quebec, um, and the, where Levesque was going to land, I guess, yes. um, was, did, was that just unknown to anybody? Was everybody wondering where he was going to land? Well, I can, only speak, I can only speak for myself. I spent a lot of time with Claude Morin, who was the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs um, and in Quebec, and occasionally, as the First Ministers would meet and I'd be invited, I'd be there too, but I spent a lot of time with Morin. They took the position after they lost the referendum in Quebec in 1980 that they were there to make a deal. And in fact, as you know, a very narrow deal on patriation basically was agreed to by the eight dissenting provinces, but I didn't feel at any stage in the game that they meant it, at least that Morin meant it. Um, I just didn't believe that their philosophy, their political party, uh, the mood of Quebec as it was at the time would permit them to come to an agreement. But you're not going to make that conclusion. You have to accept people at their face word and face value and pursue it. So uh, it was, I think, not as optimistic um, that uh, once the referendum had been dealt with and Canada was yet preserved, that we were going to get a deal. We wanted, of course, Quebec to be in there very much, and it's a chink in the agreement, to be quite frank with you, in my judgment. Uh, we're still, I think, feeling the reverberations and consequences of not having Quebec on side. But uh, there was hope, but it was saddled with a lot of this... Uh, anxiety that, would, that, that they weren't going to agree. And of course the Western issues were very problematic as well. Lougheed and Blakeney in the West had the natural resource problem, which was very huge for us in the West. And that I think could have been perhaps a showstopper as well if Mr. Trudeau hadn't conceded to a strengthened new resources section. So it was fraught with a lot of hope and a lot of worry. Um, Mr. Blakeney and Mr. Lougheed, um as well as seeing eye to eye on, on certain things, were, were there differences there? Were yes, there were differences. Uh, I think uh, Peter Lougheed, for whom I have a great deal of respect, I think he's a great Canadian, felt very strongly that, uh, first of all, resources had to be strengthened because of Supreme Court decisions, and we were with him on that. But there were uh, personality differences and philosophy differences between Mr. Lougheed and Mr. Um, Trudeau. Uh, in the case of Blakeney, less so. I mean, he was, after all, a prairie socialist, a pragmatic prairie socialist, a principled pragmatist, as I have described him. He was hugely intellectual, uh, and he had a very um, strong affection uh, for Peter Lougheed. I think the feeling was mutual. But where they really separated was the extent to which you'd, you'd want to play chicken. With, the, with national unity. These are my words, nobody else's words, and perhaps Premier Lougheed would object to them very strongly. And uh, no doubt, Albert, at that point was rising economically. We were a little bit behind them, but coming up as well. And they were the more powerful political um, province from our point of view. The tension, therefore, arose occasioned by that. Lougheed didn't want to make a deal as much as I think Blakeney wanted to make a deal. In fact, at one point, maybe a year before the kitchen, I was actually some late was holidaying in Hawaii in January, and we went straight from Toronto. I spent two days in a hotel room negotiating with uh, Marc Lalonde and Otto Lang. Chrétien had fallen ill because of all the pressure of the work, and we had a signed agreement uh, proposed for us in any event by Mr. Trudeau. And I phoned Alan in Hawaii. I said, here it is. I gave you the full report. I'm recommending we don't do it. There was a long pause. He said, I want you to come out. I said, what do you mean you want us to come out? Come on out to Hawaii in January. I thought, not a bad idea, but we didn't bring our swim trunks or our shorts. And so we went with our fur shopkas and fur coats and went to Toronto all the way to Hawaii. And, and Trudeau sent uh, his officials. This is an example of how close Saskatchewan was to joining long before the kitchen. It's a long story, an important story. We didn't. And then, of course, the 
court forced us to that fateful meeting in November. The, um, uh, Mr. Blakeney and Mr. Trudeau, um, what kind of a relationship was that? Awkward, and I could never understand that. Both were intellectual giants, uh, highly educated, interested in concepts of constitutionalism and, and the federation, federation and how it should work, and charters of rights. They had a bit of a difference on the Charter of Rights. Trudeau, of course, wanted an entrenched one. Blakeney feared, as I did too, that it would transfer power from the political processes of debating whether Sunday shopping should be allowed or not allowed, to give you an old example. It would shift it from the politicians to the judicial uh, wing. Uh, Mr. Lougheed was less, I think, uh, enamored by that. But coming back to Trudeau, there was this great intellectual match of the two. And I remember meeting with uh, Mr. Trudeau after he was no longer Prime Minister, I was Premier, and I phoned him up and uh, we agreed to have lunch in Montreal. He was a very, very wonderful host, charming host. There are other dimensions to that uh, luncheon which maybe on another occasion I might tell. And as we were walking out of the luncheon rooms at the Mount Royal Club in Montreal, down the winding stairs, I'll tell you about this because I was very, as a poor prairie politician, I was very impressed with this, this setting in, in Montreal. And uh, I said to them, tell me, I said, what is it between you two guys? He said, who do you mean? I said, well, Blakeney and you. You're intellectually equal. You're kind of, of a small L liberal predisposition. How come the two of you couldn't strike a deal? And he stopped and he looked me in the eye. We're halfway down the steps and he said, because Roy, I didn't believe that Blakeney nor you, none of you guys in Saskatchewan could make a deal without Alberta because of the influence that Alberta had by its rising economic power in the Western Canadian context. I disputed him on that. Uh, for a moment or two we tangled. You don't tangle very much with Trudeau, but at least we had a, a gentle uh, exchange which differed. And I think this probably explains why the two had an affection, well I'll say a respect for each other. There's no doubt about that. But the political assessment by one that he could not, would not get the other, namely Blakeney, on side. He'd tried a couple of times, Hawaii, a few other ventures, they'd failed. And uh, as other books document, uh, Saskatchewan would follow Alberta. Now it turns out, I think we took a leadership role. That's my biased view, but that's what I think the relationship was. The, um, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's a stupid thing, we, we should check our time, that's what I'm. He was just going to touch you, cameraman. It's 105, so... Oh, I got it. Yeah, sure. I just got to walk down, that's all. Super. <clears throat> that's where I set my little alarm for now. Am I okay to put my... You, sir. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Um, for the NDP, um, it's been written that this represented... I mean, this was a difficult issue. Very difficult. Um, describe that a bit for why? Why? Well, it was a difficult issue because... Uh, Prairie socialists, socialists in quotation marks, are very pragmatic. Douglas was a very pragmatic uh, premier. He was a great man. I had the pleasure of knowing him. I don't want to overstate that relationship, but I traveled to China with him actually for one month and got to know him quite well back in 1979. But he was always a pragmatist. And so it was with the tradition of premiers in Saskatchewan who were democratic socialists or social democrats. The cleavage came uh, between the federal wing led by Ed Broadbent and by the provincial wing led by Alan Blakeney. Uh, Broadbent, Ed Broadbent, again a person with whom, for whom I have a great deal of admiration and respect, Broadbent believed in an entrenched charter of rights and freedoms because he felt, this is my interpretation, that you could trust the courts more to protect individual rights and advance human rights than you could the political process. I think this was occasioned, not so much as an intellectual thought, but maybe it was, but more so by the fact that the prospects of the NDP ever coming close to power, keep in mind this is in the 70s, and he did pretty well, but in the 70s, was very remote. We didn't believe that. We believed that you could determine and sort out rights by going door to door, election campaigns, and debating it and winning or losing elections, and you had to do this in a pragmatic way. Well, the moment Mr. Broadbent committed himself to Mr. Trudeau, which he had very early, 
Then there was another compounding problem. Uh, Trudeau knew that we wanted a resource provision like Alberta. Both Alberta and Saskatchewan had the same problem requiring resource issue. And Ed, I think well-intentioned, was kind of an intermediary in negotiating between Blakeney and Trudeau. And, and this you could not do with Blakeney under any circumstance. And so we had a very tough patch there. I remember at one point being mandated by Blakeney to meet with Broadbent, Ed Broadbent, and it was a very, in my recollection, quite explosive conversation. I said, look, if the federal NDP buys into this package, I will do, we will do everything we can to defeat Saskatchewan New Democrat MPs federally. You're not going to get away with this. And Ed was startled. And actually, I'm kind of startled even saying this, that <laughs> members of the church <laughs> would fight each other like that. But that was the depth of the, the, uh, of the emotions which were at play. And then, of course, the moment the Supreme Court ruled that Mr. Trudeau could not move unilaterally, this permitted Ed Broadbent to change his position and say to the Prime Minister, well, okay, you've got to get more provinces on side than simply Ontario and New Brunswick. And the divisions were healed quite quickly. Not totally, I don't think, but quite quickly. And uh, the family was back together again, so to speak. The, um, 30 years later, um, what would you describe as the legacies of, of, of the Accord? Why was it important to Canada? Why to well, Australia? for me, the most important um, important development and legacy of this whole enterprise is that we became an independent nation. It is true, it could be argued that we were independent in every way, but formally or legally. We could not amend our constitution because our constitution was in London, England, the, West, uh, the British North America Act. We had to go to Westminster. They, they didn't want to do anything with it until we agreed amongst ourselves. Others will say the other momentous events were the entrenchment of a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I think that was a positive step forward too. Although being a pragmatic, I'd like to think, and later Premier of the province of Saskatchewan in the Blakeney tradition, I was a little bit worried about whether or not judges could be progressive in the advancement of social and human rights, but I think they've proven to be so. And I think that is a good thing, that there's a recourse from sometimes the harshness of political debate on rights and the emotions around that to a, a, a body that is more removed and more dispassionate and more judicially minded. So I think the entrenchment of a Charter of Rights and Freedoms is good in a very pragmatic sense, although I think this gives rise now to some current and future challenges to Canada, the strengthened power of Alberta and Saskatchewan, for that matter, all the provinces over natural resources uh, while it was good for us, and I think still is good, might present a challenge going down the road as you see the petrodollar and petro, all of the big issues that are current Keystone Pipeline, the, the Alberta oil sands issue, you, you name it. These are now in a kind of a gray zone as to who has the political and constitutional jurisdiction to legislate and to develop policies. So for, take, for example, an environmental issue, which may arise. Uh, we'll see how that sorts itself out. But on balance, I, I'm very, very proud to have played a very small role in seeing the final formal independence of a pretty progressive country, a, a democratic country, a hopefully liberal, small L country. <laughs> Uh, where we have values, uh, I think that's a, a great legacy. And it, it doesn't get any better in politics than that, by the way. If you're involved in a small way in nation building, it doesn't get better in politics than that. Yeah, I can believe, can believe. And one last question. <clears throat> that nation building, I mean, is it just our particular Canadian dilemma, this kind of dialectic nearly between the, the provinces and a, and a federal government. I mean, is that, is, it, is that something that we're just going to live with forever and it'll just be the quality of the debate that will be an issue? I think we have to realize that we're a country of 33 million people, as we speak, roughly, uh, highly regionalized. Most of 33 million are very close to the United States of America. Geographically, we're very influenced by them economically and culturally. It's always going to be a challenge to nation build. 
Uh, the challenge, uh, in my judgment, is made all the more complicated by, by our federation. Provinces are assigned powers, Ottawa's assigned powers. Now, there are one of two ways in which to build a country. One way is to simply say, well, I'm Ottawa, and what's been assigned to me as a federal government is mine. Don't meddle in it. Premiers, thank you very much. Your premiers, um, what is assigned to you is yours, and I won't meddle into yours. That's a prescription for the fabric, the, the various strands of national unity and national identity, in my judgment, being weakened. The other way is to get in there and have a very messy, difficult process, as we did in the patriation of the Constitution, but a process when it comes to advancing environmental issues, social policy, Medicare, um, well-being uh, programs, uh, right to education, all of these, this requires getting in in a federal-provincial tangle. And it's always going to be like making sausage. And nobody says you want to watch it. I, maybe I'm an old, well, I am, <laughs> an, an ex-politician who's tired about this, but I still love to see how sausage is made in this country because you make it. But it's not done cleanly or easily. So you have to have a cooperative federalism approach. Or this is kind of sounds oxymoronic. One of my colleagues coined the phrase, constructive entanglement. Uh, and it's true, you get entangled and you argue and sometimes you think, boy, I'm just fed up with these politicians, they can't get it right. But we've gotten many things in this country right because we got in there and sorted it out. And the patriation was one of them. And all the things that we have in this great country. We shouldn't abandon that. I'm afraid, by the way, that we might be lessening our desire to do that, that's another discussion for another occasion, but in my judgment, it's going to be thus, and it, um, we built a pretty good country through it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, um